All right, so we had just left off. This is the continuation of the lecture on the theory or the, excuse me, the field of anthropology. Our next le lecture will be the theory of evolution. So we had talked about cultural anthropology. Uh, we hadn't talked about biological yet. We talked about linguistics and archeology. span So now we're going to focus in on biological or physical anthropology. So it may say physical in your notes. Um, just so you know, it's the same thing. Biological anthropology and physical anthropology are the same exact thing. Um, just some colleges call it biological, some call it physical. Uh, I think most colleges are kind of transitioning to calling it biological anthropology. That's more of the, the new school way of referring to it. And physical anthropology is a little bit more old school. Um, so biological anthropology, just like it sounds, would be the study of human biological evolution and human biocultural variation. So biological anthropologists will study humans from the past, our ancestors that we call hominins. So our earliest ancestors emerged in Africa somewhere between six to eight million years ago. So the, the physical characteristics that separate us from the rest of the apes would be bipedalism or the ability to walk upright on two legs as our primary mode of motion or locomotion. And of course, there's other variations, other things that separate us as well. Um, expanding cranial capacity, increased reliance on stone tool technologies and culture, eventually language and complex symbolic expression and symbolic burial and art. Um, we'll delve into all of that, but biological anthropologists may study humans from the past, the last six, millions of, six million years of evolution that brought us to where we are today. And biological anthropologists also um, will study humans living in the present. They will look at how biological traits are influenced by the environment and environmental circumstances. They may study, for example, how UV exposure ex uh, influences the tone of our skin or how blood types vary from population to population, how we can trace migration based upon markers in our DNA, um, how we can determine um, evolution by looking at our DNA. Some humans have mutations in their DNA that allow for resistance to diseases like malaria, HIV, um, even COVID. So biological anthropologists do a wide scope of things, but they do attempt to answer questions surrounding the central tenet. What does it mean to be human? So just like any anthropologist, they're ultimately interested in the study of humanity and what it means to be human. All right, so biological anthropology is focused on two key concepts. So remember biological anthropology is also called physical. So those two key concepts, each person is a product of evolutionary history. So this will include all biological changes that have brought humans to their present form. So this is looking at um, our paleo, uh, the paleo record, paleoanthropology, looking at the skeletal remains of hominins from the last 6 million years. So looking at how we've changed anatomically based upon what's available to us in the fossil record. And also looking at, um, genetically speaking, um, how, have, how has our DNA changed over the recent past? Um, DNA study is so, was relatively new in comparison. Um, DNA technology is improving all the time. Uh, but biological anthropologists will study the fossil record and they will also study human DNA. Um, two, each person is a product of individual life history, which is a combination of our genetics and also how we are influenced by the environment. So this will include social and cultural factors. So even though biological anthropologists may be focused in on the biological and the physical and the genetic and the evidence, the hard evidence, um, they're still, they still recognize that humans are, we can't possibly understand humanity without looking at it from all angles, okay? So biological anthropologists also are interested in the what this can tell us about human behavior and human culture from the past. All right, so biological anthropologists, as I mentioned, they may study living current groups of humans. They may also study extinct groups of humans or hominins that lived over the last six million years. They may study living groups of non-human primates. We call that primatology. And then another kind of offshoot, it's not a major, uh, not a major branch, not a major subdiscipline, but forensic anthropology is um, when anthropologists have, since they have a uh, knowledge in osteology, osteology is the study of bones, uh, 
and also how um, disease affects bones and how trauma affects bones. They will work with law enforcement to solve crimes and identify cause of death by examining human skeletal remains. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about forensic anthropology here in just a moment. All right, so let's talk about one of these offshoots of biological anthropology first. This one is paleoanthropology. So paleo anthropology will study the human evolution through examining the fossil record. So looking at those fossil skeletons that have that are in the fossil record over the last six million years. Okay, we see the earliest evidence for bipedal humans, um, Salanthropus chidensis from central Central Africa in the country of Chad, dating back about six million years. And then we'll look at Ardipithecus and the Australopithecines, and then eventually our genus, genus Homo. So during unit number three in the class, we will go through the last six million years of evolution in detail. But essentially, paleoanthropologists um, strive to identify the various hominin species and determine the chronological sequence of these groups. Uh, but it's important to remember that um, evolution doesn't necessarily happen in a linear fashion, like it's often displayed in, in images. Evolution happens in these branching offshoot events. So many of these hominin species were coexisting with one another during the same time frame in the same environmental location and possibly even interbreeding. So it wasn't, you know, one species to the next one to the next to the next. It was likely that many of these species were coexisting, interbreeding, swapping genes. And we'll talk more about that once we get to unit three. Okay, and of course, paleoanthropologists will also speculate on the adaptive and behavioral strategies of these past hominin groups. So even though a paleoanthropologist may be focused on the skeletal, the physical, the biological, um, they still look at evidence for culture. They look at evidence for stone tool production and use. They look for evidence of symbolic expression, art, cave art, symbolic burial, evidence for how they organize their social groups and their families, the ways they, the ways that they got married and raised their children. Um, they will look through for evidence of this in the fossil record as well. All right, primatology is another offshoot of biological anthropology. It's not a major sub-branch or sub-discipline, but is an offshoot that's within biological anthropology. So just like it sounds, ology is study of, primatology would be the study of primates, um, the study of, bi of the biology and the behavior of the non-human primates. So this could be anything from a lemur, which is a very small primate about the size of a cat, all the way up to gorillas, which are you know, males are 400 plus pounds and everything in between. So we'll have actually two whole chapters that are going to be focused in on primatology. So we'll have a chapter that's focused in on primate taxonomy and systematics. And then we'll have another chapter that's focused on their social behavior, their social organization, their reproductive strategies, and also the way the examples of culture. Um, so culture was once thought to be uniquely human. But you'll see that many primate species, such as chimpanzees, macaques, um, capuchin monkeys, and even lemurs have examples of material culture and also self-medication as well. But in general, primatologists are interested in research topics such as social behavior, dominance hierarchies, infant care, reproductive strategies, group structure, and ranging patterns. So there's two very prominent, well-known primatologist on the slide there for you, Jane Goodall. Most of us have probably heard of Jane Goodall. She has very famously studied and fought for the conservation of chimpanzees living in Gombe over the last 50 years. Um, Diane Fossey studied the mountain gorillas living in Rwanda and Uganda, mainly in the 80s. And she actually, she was murdered. Her murder was never solved, uh, but it was believed, or it is believed that she was actually murdered by poachers, just like many of the gorillas that she studied. All right, forensic anthropology. So this is another offshoot that is within the sub-branch of biological anthropology. Forensic anthropology is not considered one of the major sub-branches or sub-disciplines, but it is an offshoot that's within biological anthropology. So like I mentioned before, it's the application of osteology or the study of bones and paleopathology, the way that disease and trauma affects the bones to investigate crime scenes and solve legal issues. So oftentimes when you're watching forensic files or cold case files, I mean, there's dozens of those shows out there on 
on the internet now on Netflix and on Amazon. There's dozens of these, you know, kind of whodunit kind of shows. And oftentimes a forensic anthropologist, and, you know, if you're into these shows, you know, take note next time you're watching, oftentimes the expert witness is a forensic anthropologist because forensic anthropologists are uniquely qualified. They are trained in how to identify skeletal remains, you know, first of all, to determine if they're human or not human, um, because those that don't have a trained eye aren't necessarily going to know. Um, this happens to forensic anthropologists all the time. They get brought a bone, you know, thinking it's a, you know, a remain of a human, remains of a human. But in fact, it was the remains of an animal. Um, but forensic anthropologists are also trained in how to identify the, um, the age of the individual, especially if it's a juvenile. They can determine the age within a few years. They can determine if it's an adult, remains of an adult human. They can determine whether it was male or female. They can oftentimes speculate on the manner of death. If it was a violent death, they can look at evidence of blunt force trauma or gunshot wounds, or if there was disease that was affecting the bones. Um, they can also determine how tall that person was, the stature, if they have the long bones, if they have the femur or the humerus. There's a mathematical equation that will allow them to calculate the stature or the height that that person was. Um, so there's essentially forensic anthropologists are coming up with what we call a biological profile. So in cases, in legal cases where skeletal remains are found and the identity of the individual is not necessarily known, but maybe um, law enforcement has a list of unsolved missing persons cases. The forensic anthropologist can then come in do a lot biological profile, determine how old the person was when he or she died. If it's an adult, determine whether it's likely male or female based on the shape of the pelvis. Determine how tall that individual was and sometimes speculate on the manner or cause of death. Okay. Um, generally not cause of death. Generally that's the medical examiner, but forensic anthropologists can help develop hypotheses on the manner of death. All right. Questions at all about the branch of biological or physical anthropology, which includes paleoanthropology, primatology, and forensic anthropology. Feeling good? Okay. All right. So now let's move on. Next part of our notes, the six steps to humanness. So this is a theme that we will continue to return to this entire 16 weeks. So this slide, this chapter just kind of introduces the concept, but we'll continue to come back to this in each and every chapter. Okay, so this first slide just kind of lists them, and then we'll we'll go over each one in more detail in the in the slides that are going to follow. Okay, so you don't have to write down every detail right now. You're just writing down the six traits that we're going to talk about. So this is essentially what separates us from the other primates, what separates us from the other mammals, what makes us unique. So the first one that we're going to look at is bipedalism. So bipedalism is essentially the fact that we walk upright on two feet, on two legs for our primary mode of locomotion. We call that bipedalism. So that was the initial physical trait or physical characteristic that separated us from the rest of the great apes. Number two is non-honing canine. That is an upper canine that is not sharpened against the third premolar. Okay, so to give you an example of one that is a honing canine, let's pull out the gorilla. Okay, so this skull here, this one is a gorilla. So you see the canine is really pronounced, really projecting, okay? So for the gorilla, the canines are sharpened against one another and there's also the space here that allows for the, the gorilla to close his jaw, okay? We call that the diastema. Okay, so this is a gorilla, and um, genetically speaking, a gorilla is very similar to us. Um, chimpanzees are about 98% identical to us. Gorillas are about 97. Um, but one thing that separates us from the other great apes is the fact that we have a reduced canine that is not sharpened against the third premolar, and we call that non-honing canine. Um, trait number three is material culture. So even though material culture is seen in other primates. Um, I think what's unique about humans is our reliance upon and our sophistication in material culture. 
Um, even though many other primates are capable of material culture, um, it's not quite as involved and we're, and they're not quite as reliant upon it as we are. Okay, so we see, we define material culture as objects that are used to manipulate the environment to enhance survival and or reproduction. Um, trait four is hunting. Now, of course, um, not uh, many animals hunt, many mammals hunt, many non-mammals hunt. Uh, but for humans and our ancestors, the difference is the degree of organization that's involved in hunting and also the technique, especially with humans, the technique that we use. We utilize a type of hunting, which is called persistence hunting. So we're not necessarily faster than our prey, but we have greater endurance because we have lost most of our body hair and we have the ability to evaporatively cool or sweat. So essentially, as we sweat, it's not necessarily the liquid that's cooling us down. It's the liquid that evaporates off the mostly hairless surface of our skin that cools us off. OK, and we call that evaporative cooling. So hunting, not that hunting is unique in general, but our strategy of hunting is unique. And also the fact that we use tools, we use weapons when we hunt is something that's somewhat uniquely human. We see that a little bit in chimpanzees. So there's lots of exceptions here, but I will agree. I will agree with your author that it is unique in the sense that it's more organized. It utilizes persistence hunting and more complex weaponry. All right. Trait number five is going to be speech. So speech or vocal communication. Of course, many other species communicate vocally and um, can even have pretty complex ways of interacting based upon tones of vocalization. Uh, but in humans, there's a very unique bone in the vocal tract. It's a U-shaped bone called the hyoid bone. I'll show you a picture here in a moment. Uh, but it is related to the anatomical capacity for articulate speech. And then trait six is going to be domesticated food production. So I think I mentioned earlier on in this lecture that, um, you know, essentially humans, we've been hunting and gathering the vast majority of our evolutionary past. Hominids have been around six million years We've only been domesticating plants and animals about the last 10, 11,000 years. Okay, so really just a blip in time. So domesticated food production is kind of that last trait that distinguishes us from the other primates. All right, so a little more detail on these. Um, so we know bipedalism emerged somewhere between six to eight million years ago. So it's obviously the ability to walk upright on two feet. And we'll look at the various skeletal adaptations, essentially what separates us from the other great apes. There's adaptations in our pelvis. We have a broad bowl-shaped pelvis, whereas a chimpanzee has a long, narrow pelvis. We have longer femurs that are angled inwards towards our knees. We have the bicondylar angle. We have an S-shaped spinal column, and we have variations in the size of our vertebrae. The lumbar vertebrae and our lower back are much larger because they're supporting the most body weight. Um, also the hallux, the big toe, the hallux in a chimpanzee, for example, looks like our thumb. Their hallux is opposable. So it means it has grasping abilities. So obviously that's beneficial for them because they're able to use their hands and their feet to help them locomote in the trees. But for humans, we have evolved to have a non-opposable big toe. So we have a big toe that's in line with the rest of our toes. So that's more beneficial for bipedal locomotion. So when you think about walking bipedally, um, you know, all of our toes are important, but the, the big toe is very important, right? It kind of acts as a stabilizer. It, it acts as a springboard. And it's a very important aspect of effective bipedal walking, jogging, and running. All right, non-honing chewing. So like I mentioned before, it's, you know, it's different from what you might see in a gorilla, for example or a chimpanzee or an orangutan. It's just, I've got the gorilla here, so I'm using this example. So the gorilla has the large prominent projecting canine that's sharpened against the other canine. And they also have that diastema, that space that allows for the gorilla to effectively close his jaw, open and close his jaw. But humans have a smaller, a reduced canine and a lack of a diastema, okay? So there's no space in between. Um, humans have also developed tools and cooking, which has assisted with the processing of food prior to consumption. So gorillas have this really prominent sagittal crest here. So the sagittal crest is actually the attachment point for the jaw muscles. So for a gorilla, the jaw muscles start down here on the ramus. They tuck underneath the cheekbones, the zygomatic bones, and then they attach all the way up here at the sagittal crest. 
So that's related to their diet. Gorillas are predominantly vegetarian. They eat mainly vegetation, some fruit, but mainly vegetation. And when you think about it, vegetation takes a lot of chewing force, especially if you've got a very large body size. You've got to eat a lot of vegetation to get enough calories to support a 400 plus body size. So gorillas spend about 50% of their waking hours just chomping on vegetation. So the reason they have these, you know, really massive jaws, massive molars, uh, massive sagittal crest is actually related to their diet. It's related to having a rough, tough diet that requires a lot of chewing pressure, a lot of jaw force. Okay. Whereas humans, we had developed tools and cooking to process our food prior to consumption that has allowed us to lose that, you know, really prominent uh, large canine and large molars and to lose that sagittal crust. All right, so number three, like I mentioned, is material culture. So that's defined as objects that humans will use to manipulate their environment to enhance survival and reproduction. So even though material culture is not necessarily completely exclusive to humans, because we know that chimpanzees, macaques, um, uh, capuchin monkeys, many other primates, uh, uh, you know, dozens of species we'll talk about, and the second unit that are capable of using and manipulating the environment with tools. Uh, but essentially what makes the, the human tool use unique is their dependence upon it for day-to-day -day survival. If we woke up tomorrow and all of a sudden somebody told us we couldn't use material culture anymore, you know, we may have, you know, we'd adapt, of course, but it would be a major, we would have a major, it would have a major impact, major shift change on our life. All right, number four is hunting. Like I mentioned, like this one's probably the, the hardest one to argue, but I think what your authors mean here is that essentially hunting is unique to humans in the sense that we have social organization in the way that we hunt. So we have the organized group pursuit of animals. We also use weaponry. We use tools and weapons when we hunt. And we also utilize that technique called persistence hunting. Okay, and it requires complex cooperation, tool use, and traveling long distances. So hunting is not unique to humans, but the way we hunt is unique to humans, is essentially what your author is saying here. All right, number five, like I mentioned, is speech. So there's that picture of the hyoid bone I promised you. So it's that U-shaped bone that we see in the vocal tract. Okay, and that U-shaped bone in the vocal tract is really um, critical, crucial, to the anatomical capacity and ability to make, to formulate words, to formulate articulate speech. Okay, so we see a hyoid bone in modern Homo sapiens, and we also see it in the Neanderthals. Um, other hominins, even other primates have a hyoid bone, but it's structured very differently. So we see this very, you know, specific structure with Neanderthals and Homo sapiens. So it's likely that not just Homo sapiens, but also Homo neanderthalensis had the capacity for language. Um, there's also a gene. Once we get into the chapter on Neanderthals, we'll talk about the FOXP2 gene. Um, that's a gene that all mammals have, but there's a critical mutation, a critical change in that gene right around the time that the Neanderthals were evolving. So it's very possible that not just Homo sapiens, but also Neanderthals had the capacity for language because we know that FOXP2 is also critical for the capacity for modern day speech. All right, and then last but not least is domesticated food production. So essentially agriculture, essentially the, when humans started to manipulate or try, attempt to control the growth cycles of both plants and animals to allow for a more reliable food source, okay? So the agricultural or Neolithic revolution essentially allowed for humans to create a surplus of food. It also allowed for humans to have a more reliable food source because hunting and gathering, you're kind of, um, you know, you're, you get a very, you get a nice variety, a diverse diet, but sometimes you're, um, you know, you're more subject to things like climatic shifts or droughts that may impact the availability of some of your food sources. Um, so one of the big benefits, the big advantages of domesticated food production, especially once humans kind of figured it out is it allowed them to create a surplus. It allowed them to have a more reliable food source. It allowed them to kind of, you know, take down roots and start, you know, living in sedentary villages, which has its pros and cons that we'll talk about when we get to that chapter. Um, but essentially that's kind of that last trait, that last kind of step to humanness that we're gonna talk about, you know, later on this semester. Do you guys have questions about the six steps to humanness or anything we've talked about so far?
We're feeling good. Okay. All right. So now we're going to move on to the scientific method. So we talked about methodology. So methodology of a cultural anthropologist is ethnography and participant observation. The ethnography, the methodology of an archaeologist is site excavation. So very slowly and carefully um, going through the archaeological record to extract cultural remains of humans. So for a biological anthropologist, they will utilize the scientific process, the scientific method, just like any other scientist would. So this process, it begins with systematic observations of the natural world. So through these observations, scientists will identify problems, they will develop questions, and then they will develop a mechanism to test the hypothesis. So they gather data. So data are used to test the validity of a hypothesis. And we'll talk about what a hypothesis here is here in just a second. But know that a hypothesis is utilized to explain, predict, and it can be refuted. So hypotheses, as I'm sure if you've taken a science class, you know, is structured as an if-then statement. If blank variable is related to blank variable, comma, then I predict this. So to keep it simple, we may say something like, if parking spot availability is related to the week in the semester, comma, then I predict it will be easier to find parking on campus during week 10 in comparison with week two. And anybody that's attended college can probably, you know, say that's a fairly good hypothesis because, you know, during the first couple of weeks of the semester, you know, attendance is still very high. You know, students know that th those first two weeks, you know, they have to attend or they may be dropped for non-participation, non-attendance. So, you know, not to say that you're not going to attend later on, but that's just, you know, the way the semester goes. The first, you know, three, four or five weeks, it's very difficult to find parking on campus. And then as you move on throughout the semester, it gradually gets easier and easier, okay? So that's obviously a very simple thing, but you know, I, I wanna keep it simple so that we can make sure that we understand how to structure this. All right, so the, the, scientific, method, the scientific method is the process of essentially a way of knowing the world around us through observations and data collection. It's valuable to us as anthropologists because it ultimately results in an ever expanding knowledge base. So this is one of the many reasons I love my field so much is we haven't answered all the questions. The scientists are still out there. Uh, we're still out there researching it. Okay. We haven't developed all of the, we haven't tested all the hypotheses. We haven't, um, you know, we haven't essentially completely uncovered all the mysteries that are out there essentially. So it is also empirical or based on observation. All right, so I want you to think about the scientific method as well as like three levels, as three levels of knowledge. So of course we start out with the observations, with the questions about the natural world. And then through these questions, we develop hypotheses, okay? So the hypothesis is the very bottom level. And then that hypothesis, the if then statements, so let's use our example before, if parking spot availability is related to the week in the semester, comma, then I predict, that parking spot availability will be higher during week 10 in comparison with week two, okay? So we developed a hypothesis and it's one that's testable, right? We could very easily decide, okay, on a Wednesday during week two, we're gonna go out in a particular parking lot, um, a major student parking lot, and we're just gonna count. We're gonna count the available parking spots between the hours of one and two o'clock PM on a Wednesday during week two. And then we have to do the exact same thing during week 10. We have to make sure it's a Wednesday. We have to control for the day of the week. And then we have to also control for the time of day. Because if we if we manipulate too many variables at once, then we don't know what's impacting our data. We don't know if it's the week in the semester, if it's the day of the week or the time of day, okay? So we have to make sure that we're only manipulating one variable at a time, okay? So that's another aspect of the scientific method. We can only manipulate one variable at a time. All right, so if that hypothesis, let's say hypothetically, we go out there, we develop our procedure, we test that hypothesis, and we find out, yes, it is actually, that is true, that parking spot availability is absolutely greater during week 10 in comparison with week two. Okay, if we find that that is true, our job isn't done yet. We have to go back and do it again, and again, and again, and again, and again. And then we have to make sure that other scientists go out there and test our hypothesis using our method. 
And we have to make sure that that hypothesis is supported again and again and again and again. Um, then we have to make sure that it's true on all campuses, not just on our campus. We have to test it in other environments, okay? So you guys get the picture. It's It goes through a very rigorous testing process. And if that hypothesis is found to be absolutely true in all circumstances, supported in all circumstances, then it will eventually become a scientific theory, okay? So that first level, the beginning level is the hypothesis. The middle level is scientific theory. And then the only thing with more clout, more validity than a scientific theory would be scientific law, okay? Like thermodynamics, gravity, and the law of motion. All right, so this, this kind of chart here kind of demonstrates what I just talked about. So we start out with our observations. So like I mentioned, let's keep it simple. Um, let's talk about our first example. So our observations as students and as, you know, as professors, we may have noticed that, yeah, it's a, it's a pain in the butt to find parking the beginning of the semester, but then it gets easier as the semester goes on. So we've observed this. And of course, we, I'm sure we can all think of reasons why, but you know, right now we're just we're just making that observation. We know that parking spot availability is difficult, challenging during the first five weeks of the semester, and then it starts to get easier. Okay, so from this observation, we're developing a hypothesis, and we have to make sure that it's structured as an if-then statement. So it's always, and you know, write this down, this is important, if blank variable is related to blank variable, comma, then make your prediction. Okay, so if blank variable is related to blank variable, comma, then make your prediction. So if parking spot availability is related to the week in the semester, comma, then I predict that parking spot availability will be greater during week 10 in comparison to week two. Okay, and then through your once you've developed your prediction, your hypothesis, and once you've structured it properly and made sure that it's testable, then you develop the actual experiment, your data collection techniques. So you have to make sure that you're only manipulating one variable at a time, okay? Now you could do other experiments. You could do other experiments that were maybe looking at the time of the day or the day of the week as it relates to parking lot availability or parking spot availability. But for this particular experiment, we're simply interested in week two versus week 10. So we do that experiment where we go out into a particular parking lot on a Wednesday from one o'clock to two o'clock and we count all of the available parking spots. Okay, we record that data from one o'clock to two o'clock on a Wednesday during week two. And then we need to do the same exact thing on a Wednesday from one o'clock to two o'clock during week 10, okay? So we have to make sure that we're controlling for the day of the week and the time of day. Now, sometimes there may be things that are out of our control, for example, you know, there may be inclement weather all of a sudden during week 10. There may be a hurricane or an earthquake or just a rain even. Or there may be an event on campus on that Wednesday during week 10. Or there may be, I mean, just by chance, maybe a bunch of professors cancel class on that Wednesday during week 10. So, you know, sometimes there's factors that are out of our control that as experimenters, we can't necessarily um, you know, we can't control for everything. So what that what that means is if those one of those unpredicted things occurs during week 10 or during week two, that means we have to throw that data out and start over again. Okay. Uh, but let's just say none of that happens. Let's say that, you know, it's a you know nice sunny California day during week two and during week 10. And let's say that we're able to collect that data and we do find that yes, it is in fact easier to find parking during week 10 in comparison to week two then we can say that, yes, in fact, our hypothesis is supported. So we're still not done yet. We still need to do further testing. We need to make sure that our data is supported by multiple tests and multiple semesters. And then we give our experiment to other researchers and have them test it. We take it to other campuses and test it there. So only then, if it stands the test of time, it stands all of these tests and, founds, and it's found to be supported in all circumstances, then that's the only time when we can then make it a theory instead of a, instead of a hypothesis, okay? Now, if it's rejected, it doesn't mean we didn't learn anything because it could have been a fluke, right? It could have been, you know, there could have been some factor we weren't aware of that was impacting the parking spot availability during week 10. Maybe there was an event we didn't know about or, you know, maybe no professors canceled class during week 10 on that day. So maybe everybody was there. 
So, you know, that sometimes those factors are out of our control. So if our hypothesis is rejected, then we still go back and do further testing. If it's continuing to be rejected, then okay, we need to go back to the drawing board. So that's when we go back a new or revised hypothesis. So we're going back here to this step. Okay. All right. So essentially, the only way something becomes a theory, at least within the scientific community, the only way it becomes a theory is if it's gone through this rigorous process. If it's gone through a rigorous process of hypothesis testing, and it's found to be true, found to be supported in all circumstances by multiple researcher, researchers in multiple settings. Okay, that's the only way that something becomes a scientific theory. Okay, so that's important. The reason I spend so much time on this is we're about to learn about, if we have time today, we'll start delving into the theory of evolution. So even though sometimes when you hear the word theory, you may think, oh, that's just one person's idea or one scientist's idea. But really, at least within the scientific community, the only way something will get that title is if it's gone through this very rigorous testing process. Okay, so at least within the scientific community, theory has a lot of cloud, has a lot of validity. Okay. All right. So that's the end of chapter one lecture. So I'm going to go to stop share and I'm actually going to pause the recording just for